Welcome back to the class. We are in the concluding class on uh, Homo hierarchicus, uh, the, the 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 magnum opus of uh, Louis Dumont, uh, who is considered to be um, you know the the most important scholar who propounded a structuralist understanding of caste system. Uh, in the past two classes, we have been discussing on the same book, Homo hierarchicus. In the first uh, introduction, I uh, explained how. Homo hierarchicus represents the kind of structuralist theoretical framework. And in the previous class, in the last class, uh, just concluded class, we discussed how he uh, you know, theorized uh, the, the opposition between purity and impurity as the fundamental uh, ideology or fundamental principle on which this whole, uh, whole caste system is, is, is fixed. Now, he is moving into another uh, very important uh, dimension of the whole idea of hierarchy and theory of Varna. So, hierarchy is said to involve gradation, but is asserted uh, to be distinct from both power and authority. It is religious ranking and classifies things and beings according to their degree of dignity. Okay? It is an all-embracing em comprehensive concept. Hierarchy and the scheme of Varnas are found to be in consonance with each other as Varna and Jati. In fact, as are Varna and Jati. In fact, hierarchy encompasses both the Varna divisions and the caste system. So, what is the fundamental argument of Dumont? Fundamental argument of Dumont is that the caste system has to be understood as something that is founded on a uh, foundational principle of the opposition between pure and impure. Okay? And this kind of hierarchy is what we understand it as the ritual hierarchy. Okay? It, is a, it, it is based on the notion of ritual notions of purity and impurity because Brahmins are considered to be on top not because Brahmins are powerful, not because Brahmins are politically powerful, not because they have more power, not because they are economically powerful, but ritually they are considered to be pure. Okay? And certain other castes are considered to be impure, not because they have no power, not because they have, you know, they, they have no economic power, but because they are considered to be ritually impure. Okay? So, this is the kind of a uh, idea this is the kind of a uh, you know hierarchy the pure hierarchy that Dumo talks about okay so Dumo says that his theorization of this pure hierarchy it it goes very well with the varna scheme of things varna scheme of things you know there is it's the brahmins kshatriya vaishya and chudra and then this whole uh, untouchables fall uh, you know outside of this whole uh, system so this varna system according to Dumo fits perfectly with his theory of pure hierarchy Okay. So, let me reiterate, let me repeat, pure hierarchy uh, according to Dumo or the basic ideology according to Dumo is the ritual hierarchy okay, which uh, attributes highest status to Brahmins and the lowest status to the, to the uh, untouchables okay, and uh, relative positions for those who come in between and it has nothing to do with, okay, according to Dumo, it has nothing to do with the political power or uh, economic power it is purely religious or ritual status but it is asserted to be distinct from both power and authority it is a religious ranking and classifies things and beings according to their degree of dignity okay so this dignity is the kind of a status that is uh, that is attached to the notions of ritual purity if hierarchy is isolated as purely religious value its connection with power needs to be defined so one of the perennial problem that Dumo identified or a host of other people uh, identified is that the people we say that the brahmins are on the top and untouchables are on the at the bottom okay this is the conventional uh, argument or even dumo argues that this is the nature of indian caste system okay so uh, if hierarchy is isolated purely religious value now how do we account for power okay because power as as we have seen in so many accounts of ethnographic uh, you know scholars that many times it is not the brahmins who are the really powerful people but it is the people who are below than that okay in many times brahmins are not the brahmins are the people who are not holding the political power but it is the caste or varnas you know below the, that particular group so if hierarchy cannot give a place to power as such without contradicting its own principle Okay, because if you look into the, the actual way in which power operates, you see Brahmins are not on the top, but Brahmins are somewhere below, some, or maybe even in the middle, or maybe even, 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 even below. 
there could be a whole lot of martial uh, classes, martial castes, and other groups who might be, uh, you know, occupying this whole, uh, you know, the, the 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 topmost position. Okay, so hierarchy cannot give a place to power as such without contradicting its own principle. So there is an absolute distinction between priesthood and royalty. The king has lost his religious prerogative. He does not sacrifice. He has sacrifice performed. So, uh, Dumo comes up with an argument that in India, okay. At some point in history, there was an arrangement, there was an agreement between the priests uh, or, or, or some mechanism happened, some uh, incident or process happened through which there was an absolute distinction between priesthood and royalty. Okay? Priesthood and royalty were clearly separated. Okay? Priesthood uh, about uh, people who uh, you know, indulge in uh, religious, spiritual matters okay, concerning the transcendental one. And they were separated from uh, royalty who deal with temporal power or royalty who deal with political power. Okay, there was a clear separation between that. The king has lost its religious prerogative and, and there was an arrangement that the king has lost his religious prerogative. He does not sacrifice but he has sacrificed performed. A political king, a political uh, leader or a, or a political you know, authority cannot conduct Yagas or or yajnas by himself. He cannot be a priest. Okay, the priestly class are entirely separate. A king is a king in the secular sense of the term. A king can never be a priest, and a priest can never be a king. Okay, this is a very very important uh, insight or important argument that Dumo brings into the picture. The king has lost his religious prerogative, so king cannot perform a yajna, king cannot perform a puja, a, a, a uh, you know sacrifice, but he has sacrifice performed by the priests who are dependent on him. Okay? While they are dependent on him, that his their dependency is also limited. They have certain amount of sovereignty because the king is bound to depend on them. Okay? At the same time, king is more powerful secular in secular terms king is more powerful in theory power is ultimately subordinated to priesthood whereas in practice priesthood subordinated to power okay so in theory power is ultimately subordinated to priesthood because that is what demo argues as the pure hierarchy okay the pure religious hierarchy exists that is a structural argument structural feature but in practice the priesthood subordinate is subordinated to power status and power and consequently spiritual power and temporal power are absolutely distinguished Okay, so this uh, parallel authority, one is uh, you know status and power, status coming from uh, from religious or spiritual power, uh, authority and power coming from uh, temporal power, they are absolutely distinguished in India. So that is why Dumo would argue that unlike uh, Europe, where you had a pope, a Christian pope, who was both the political leader as well as a religious authority. Okay, a concentration of temporal as well as spiritual uh, power never happened in India. That is a very, very important argument, unlike in many other places where a priest, a religious head also could become a political head. Whereas in India, a religious head was always separated from the uh, political head. The political head of the country, of, of the nation, of, of the kingdom was always a different person compared to the religious head. What remains problematic, however, is the connection of hierarchy with the power. For hierarchy cannot give a place to power as such without contradicting its own principle. Therefore, it must give a place to power without saying so and this is obliged to close its eyes to this point on pain of destroying itself. So, so here as you can see, uh, Dumo really struggles to you know uh, account for this kind of a contradiction. So, he says that in theory, the religious uh, status must be privileged but in practice, it is the political power that uh, is on the top. So, he says that, uh, that a, it's a kind of a practical arrangement. So, hence the absence of a supreme spiritual authority in India, that is a supremacy of spiritual authority was never expressed politically. This is exactly the same po point that we mentioned. In India, the supreme spiritual authority in India, the supremacy of spiritual authority was never expressed politically. There was a clear separation between the, uh, the, the political authority and the religious authority. So, this disjunction of power and status is older than caste 
and only after that hierarchy can manifest itself in a pure form. So, this is uh, you know the way in which uh, Dumo puts forward this distinction between the status and power must have happened before caste. Okay? Only once the, this, this distinction happened, only then the pure hierarchy, that is a pure hierarchy of privileging purity over impurity uh, can come into picture and then all uh, everything else can uh, fall in its place. Okay? So, if in, in a nutshell, uh, Dumo's argument is that caste system is based on a structuralist principle of the opposition between pure and impure and the uh, the, the opposition between pure and impure and the disjunction between power and status okay so two uh, two things this pure impure power and status okay so maybe this is a wrong uh, uh, interpretation power and wrong and, and uh, uh, status are not uh, kind of you know uh, presented as 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 a uh, you know, hierarchical way but power and status were distinguished. There was a distinction between power and uh, status. Now, just a remaining uh, section, just a kind of brief summary of each of his chapters uh, so that you know how uh, broadly he went into uh, different uh, areas. So, the chapter 4 shows that the traditional division of labor, that the Jatmani system is based on a religious values rather than economic logic. Okay? It does not, however, account for all economic transactions and Dumo admits this. Chapter 5 considers the regulation of marriage, endogamy, isogamy, hypergamy in terms of the key concept of hierarchy. So, 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 so that, that book, as I mentioned, is a very interesting one. Okay? Uh, it is a very uh, unconventional way of writing. Uh, if you read the book, he would, you would see that he makes the argument uh, up front. Okay? He, he theorizes, he makes his theory up front. And in the subsequent chapters, he is uh, belaboring to uh, you know, explain and establish the theory. So, many times that is not how books are written. So, in the fourth chapter is about Jajmani system and I hope you are familiar with the Jajmani system. It is a traditional system that existed in India where many times this uh, agricultural landlord, the people who have huge uh, you know um, land under their control they are considered to be the judgment or the or the master uh, on this family a host of service uh, castes uh, will have kind of a the traditional affiliation okay for example porters cobblers washermen barbers and uh, certain uh, know, untouchable families so a, a group of families will have affiliation with a particular judgment family and these families will render <coughs> Sorry, these families will render their services to this particular judgment family and they are compensated mostly at the time of harvest or at the time of festivals mostly in kind. So, it was a kind of a traditional uh, connection between uh, the upper caste landowning family and the service castes. So, and the chapter 4 considers the regulations of marriage, different kinds of marriage. So, in, in all these chapters, he is coming up with uh, all these observations to basically buttress his claim. Chapter 6 carries the argument further to cover rules concerning contact, untouchability of food and vegetarianism. The opposition between the pure and the impure emerges clearly and convincingly in these three chapters. So, so uh, the sixth chapter is about how uh, various rules and regulations okay, associated with purity and impurity, how there are certain uh, you know, civic and religious restrictions imposed on certain uh, castes, certain privileges accorded to certain other castes. So, all these restrictions and privileges according to Dumo is basically aimed to keep them separate. Okay? For example, um, prohibition of in the dining, untouchable and, and, and uh, upper caste people were never allowed to have food together. That was considered as the greatest uh, sin or as a greatest uh, you know, uh, crime. Or uh, the upper caste people, the vegetarian people consuming meat was considered as a major defiling act. So, all these things are, are basically uh, to keep these two people away and separated. Chapter 7 deals with the power and territory and chapter 8 with justice and authority. Okay? It is here that the confrontation of the ideology with observed social reality is most prominent. In conformity with our method, we shall now begin to set out uh, what is actually encountered in caste society while not figuring directly uh, in ideology. So, so, these are the chapters in which he brings in a lot of uh, you know, uh, empirical data from his own research as well as research from his fellow anthropologists. We are now brought uh, face to face with the territory, power, social dominance and ownership of wealth and their mutual relationship. These are said to be questions of fact and not 
or of theory. In fact, in terms of the theory, they either surreptitiously, they enter surreptitiously on the scene. Power pretends to be equal of status. So here, as many uh, critics have observed, uh, Dumo is, uh, uh, is, is, is at pains uh, to explain okay, why there are, there are so much of, of counter evidences to his theory. Okay, so that is why uh, he acknowledges that we are now brought to face to face with the territory, power, social dominance and ownership of wealth and their mutual relationship. So, so these are the temporal secular elements are the ones which actually do not fit into his larger theory. So, these are said to be questions of fact and not of all theory. In fact, in terms of theory, they end surreptitiously. So, he uh, and this term is very, very interesting. He says that the power uh, enters only surreptitiously in the scene. Power pretends to be equal to status, but he argues status is always more important because status is, accord, according to Dumo, is the central structural feature, not power. Dominant caste, factions and economics are discussed in this very framework. The final conclusion expectedly is, just as religion in a very a way encompasses politics, so politics encompasses economics within itself. The difference is that the politico-economic domain is separated, named uh, in a subordinate position as against religion, while economic remains undifferentiated within politics. So, his argument is very clear that all the domain of economics and politics are much are, are separated and are also inferior to that of the domain of religion. Okay. Or, an, or the caste system is, uh, is an arrangement in which, which is fundamentally based on the religious uh, notion, not on the political or economic uh, foundation. So, so this uh, argument is something very, very strong. So, that is why he talks about pure hierarchy. He talks about uh, how caste system really represents uh, a basic ideology, pure ideology, uh, pure hierarchy, the opposition between pure and impure. So, this, this uh, religious character, he argues, is the most important attribute of Indian society and not the political or, or, or social factors. Chapter 8 passes on from the power to authority. Ethnographical data on caste government from Uttar Pradesh are examined. Such matters as the source of authority, the village panchayat, the caste assembly, caste jurisdiction and excommunication are discussed. Here also, Dumo makes a major concession in favor of ethnographic evidences as against ideology. The main argument of Dumo's essay ends with chapter 8. Chapter 9 deals with renunciation and sects, the opposites of the notions of collective man and caste. So, uh, the major argument associated with his uh, theorization ends with chapter 8 and 9 onwards, he is actually looking into uh, the ideas of renunciation and sect. Because renunciation is something important because it is seen as the uh, most striking manifestation of individualism. Isn't it? Uh, a, a, a person, he renounces everything, he declares himself to be completely autonomous, not bound by uh, any strings attached uh, by the society. So, he wanted to understand how renunciation is such a powerful institution in India, which is otherwise collective. The opposition of the notion of collective man and caste. An examination of this is a methodological necessity device for Dumo, for he seeks an understanding of India and of Western society through a dialectical process, through the, the juxtaposition of logically opposite cultural types. So, as I mentioned, the caste on one side and the and, and renunciation on the other, they are the opposite of the same. Okay, because in a caste society, you are, uh, you know, your your every aspect of your life is decided by the society. Okay, and and he believes that in a society being a primitive, uh, uh, you know, traditional society is bound by collectivity. On the other hand, the same Indian society exhibit, uh, you know, uh, renoun uh, renouncers or or or. Uh, you know, uh, people who, who leave everything, okay, uh, ascetics, okay, who yogis and, and other people who are profoundly individual, individualistic, who are profoundly independent, po profoundly autonomous. This is the most important conclusion. The fundamental structural element of these two or all societies are the same. Highly significant difference between them arise out of the different patterns of relationship between the elements, however. How Western society and, uh, appears differently and how Indian society appears differently is only because of the way in which the structural elements are structured. But ultimately, the fundamental uh, you know, character of all these societies are same.
okay so in this society appear to be more collective uh, because uh, the caste system uh, you know uh, through uh, specific structural element uh, you know articulations provide more visibility to the caste relation and not that of the western society so the chapter take uh, 10 takes up the problem of comparison uh, there are caste among non hindus and outside india uh, are there castes okay given you must emphasize upon ideology and upon hierarchy it is not surprising to read one is therefore led to see the caste system as an indian institution having its full coherence and validity vitality in the hindu environment but continue in, in existence in more or less accentuated forms in groups adhering to other religions so he is almost of the uh, firm opinion that uh, caste system as uh, you see in india is an indian phenomenon because uh, indian phenomenon mainly because it is derived from uh, a uh, specific ideology uh, based on the the opposition between pure and impure so he argues that it is something confined to indian society and not present elsewhere in chapter 11 comparison is continued but in temporal rather than spatial terms in other words dumont uh, takes up the problem of the of change what is the caste system belongs to uh, what is the caste system becoming nowadays the tone of the whole discussion is set by his statement made at the very outset the contemporary literature exaggerates change one thing is certain the society as an overall framework has not changed there has been changes in the society and not of the society so uh, this is a very uh, interesting argument which he says that um, nowadays people are uh, you know exaggerating social change they are all you know peripheral changes okay uh, typical uh, expected of a uh, you know structuralist who believes that society does not change at all so he says that uh, only uh, certain kind of a peripheral certain kind of superficial changes are happening but it is the changes in the society and changes not of the society dumo concludes by asserting that hierarchy is a universal necessity and that if it is not formally recognized as society it may assert itself in pathological form like racism it is therefore of the greatest importance for western man to endeavor to study and understand a social system in which hierarchy is recognized and in fact accorded the status of a first principle this is why the book is offered to the french public okay this is a point which i have been uh, you know telling uh, or or it's been highlighted all through he is addressing the french uh, public he is saying that uh, though we uh, celebrate and embrace individualism there are competing ideologies uh, and for example hierarchy is an extremely important central feature which also um, appears uh, uh, are also salient in the western society so if you don't uh, acknowledge it and then provide it with with uh, uh, you know adequate framework it might appear as a kind of a distortion or second kind of a pathological form that is racism uh, it is therefore of the greatest importance of western man to endeavor to study and understand a social system in which hierarchy is recognized in fact according to the status of first principle that is why the book is offered to the french uh, public so this is the uh, kind of a concluding remark of dumo uh, to his uh, readers so as i mentioned um, this book is of of monumental significance uh, considered to be a classic which uh, you know completely shattered or, or completely questioned the existing scholarship on caste which almost uh, dismissed the kind of existing scholarship and then you know methodological frameworks used by people and then put forward a very very nuanced and very 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 uh, you know loud theorization very very uh, you know important formidable theorization so in the coming class we will look into the criticisms there are a lot of people have criticized uh, demo and we will look into those criticisms in the coming class okay so i'm winding up the class uh, thank you